If you think building a low maintenance garden that's beautiful and also reflects your personality sounds too good to be true, today we're going to show you how. You won't want to miss it, so stay tuned as we garden smart from North Carolina. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program makes house calls. By ordering online, the lawn you want can be delivered right to your door. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program is a proud sponsor of Public Television and Garden Smart. should be arrested for crimes against potted plant kind. My house is where plants came to die. miracle Grow Potting Mix is designed to help grow big, beautiful plants. Everyone grows with miracle Grow. Wilmington, North Carolina is a port city that is located on the Cape Fear River and is also only a short drive to three beautiful beaches. It's home to some of the state's most amazing gardens, many of which have a special focus on preserving and creating natural habitats. Designing natural habitats takes a keen understanding of specific plant life that works well together to create an environment that encourages wildlife and can be maintained in a minimally invasive way. Natural habitats are often much lower in maintenance, use less water, and they also invite birds and other animals into the garden. Today we have the pleasure of spending the day with Andy and Sandy Wood, who are pioneers in the field. This husband-wife team brings years of valuable experience to the projects that they build and manage, and they provide valuable insight into how these ecosystems are maintained. Sandy worked for the North Carolina Division of Soil and Water Conservation before she founded her design company, Habitats, in 1992. She specializes in habitat gardening that benefits birds, bees, butterflies, as well as her many clients. Andy is a fourth generation biologist, a coastal ecologist, as well as a decorated author and conservation educator. His job is to study Sandy's projects to determine the effectiveness of the habitat and how they can be optimized to attract surrounding wildlife. Together, they're responsible for some of the most biodynamic sites in the area, and today they'll be giving us a glimpse into the art and science of habitat gardening. Sandy and Andy, thank you so much for being with us today. Both of you guys have extremely interesting jobs and we'd just like to learn a little more about you. Uh, Sandy, what is it that you do? Uh, well, I design gardens for wildlife, uh, habitat gardening basically, bringing in birds, bees, and butterflies through uh, a diverse selection of plants, both native and ornamental, old-fashioned, things that are near and dear to sometimes through the homeowners, so a little bit of a uh, chance to broaden the landscape. Wonderful. Andy, your background is in ecology, I understand, and how does that marry with what Sandy does? Uh, actually, in many interesting ways, because what Sandy is doing is, in a very real sense, she's replicating um, a lot of what nature is trying to do on its own, but she's crafting. She's a habitat artisan, right. and so okay. she's crafting habitats for property owners and I get to come in and see the results of that which include uh, observing toads or box turtles or the invertebrates that are in the leaf litter and, mm -hmm. and putting together some of the elements of what's going on in the yard sharing that with the homeowner so that they have a greater appreciation for what they're actually contributing to the entire community. Sure. Now, Sandy, why do you think native or natural gardening is important, and how do you do that? Well, the, native, the selection of native plants brings uh, a lot of diversity to the uh, landscape. Uh, native plants, generally, they attract a lot of wildlife, and they're often disease-resistant, and um, 
maybe don't need the additional water. I don't use any irrigation in my yards, mm -hmm. and I also uh, refrain from using chemicals. So uh, most of my yards are chemical-free and uh, irrigation-free, but they survive quite well on the amounts of water that we get annually. Uh, so native plants are so well adapted, and, and basically it's the fact that they create so much diversity. And one plant alone might bring in 47 different species of birds. Wow. So you've got that as a base and then just build from there. Wonderful. Andy, when you're looking at, at working with Sandy with these, these habitats, what kind of things are you trying to you know, help design into the landscape to attract wildlife, or, or how does your role work here? Really just reinforcing um, what, what Sandy mentioned, and that is the emphasis on diversity. Plant diversity will uh, bring about wildlife diversity. And, and when we say wildlife in a backyard setting like this, we're not talking about black bears and, right. <laughs> and things like that. We're talking about box turtles and, mm -hmm. and toads and, and even obscure wildlife that are in decline, like the box turtle. Sure. And so what Sandy's doing is replacing sod with with a selection of diverse plants, which will eventually bring in a diversity of birds, insects, and a whole host of other things that are in need of space to live. Great. We have a wonderful example of your work here, and uh, let's go take a look at it. Come on. Sandy, this is certainly a very non-traditional backyard. There aren't, there aren't many that I've seen that look like a woodland paradise. and. Uh, and it has, you know, high shade, almost a park kind of appearance. Mm -hmm. What was the space when you encountered it, and what was it that the homeowner wanted? Well, in 1992, when the homeowner called us in here, it was, uh, as she put it, a bland and uninspiring <laughs> yard. Uh, solid grass from the walkway and the porch all the way to the back border, and uh, very few trees. So it was, as I say, uninspiring. And she was sensitive to chemicals and there was an uncertain history of the yard mm -hmm. uh, as far as what had been applied and the goal was to remove all of the sod and create island beds. So this is what we did. Yeah, very nice. So how long did this process take? Uh, well, we started in the summer of 92 and uh, by removing sod with a sod cutter. So we, we tackled that and then it was a process of bringing in soil and amending and creating the paths and the islands. and just bringing the, uh, the plants into the space. So by spring of 93, we had it planted and ready to go and grow. And grow it did, so. <laughs> <laughs> How did you approach the design of this space, Sandy? Well, it was really based on what the homeowner's desire was, and she wanted uh, flexibility and mobility in the yard, so the first idea was to get some paths in after we mm -hmm. took away the sod, create the island beds to highlight different um, different little habitats. And so we could do a little butterfly garden or a little birds-oriented garden, uh, places for them to feed and, and nest and whatnot. So it was really just to bring some life to the yard. Sure. This is a very diverse, natural, almost in some ways, you know, wild kind of landscape. It looks like an old growth forest that you know, has all these new emerging species. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this was of course planted. Some things are volunteers, mm -hmm. but what kind of plant life um, specifically did you incorporate into the design? Well, I, I started with kind of intentionally a few of my favorites and then honored some of their favorites. So uh, the, uh, one of the homeowners, he, he particularly liked the red bud and being a native tree, we supported that, uh, brought in some berry producing things, yopon, winter berry. Mm -hmm. uh, right behind us, the summer sweet, clethra, was good for the butterflies. And then we stuck with some of the old fashioned things too, so because we'd get some nice fragrance and it would create a, a sense of, um, oh, pleasure to be able to walk down the path and get this fragrance wafting up through. So that's what the gardenias did for us. And yeah. then over time, things have uh, surprised us and just happened too. The oaks, uh, we had some tulip poplars come in quite by surprise, which has just been some beautiful stately trees. A um, little bit of overgrowth sometimes, and you have to get a you know, check on that because it's a naturalized space and it wanted to kind of go its own way. Yeah, and so there's just the, the give and take and the push and pull of working with what nature's giving Absolutely. you at this point. Absolutely, and then we've had storms, and right. that, that can put a challenge and a change to a habitat real quick, and, and it did, and as a result, we were able to do some new things and brought in some other interesting stuff. That's what keeps it exciting. Absolutely. <laughs>
With the conventional landscape, I think the maintenance is oftentimes a lot simpler, at least it's more apparent. We're gonna mow the lawn and then make little meatballs out of the shrubs or, you know, we're gonna clip them into, mm -hmm. you know, just long expanses of manicured green. With this kind of landscape, it's, it's not necessarily apparent right off the bat how we would maintain it and what that process mm -hmm. might look like. What are some of the things that you have to do to keep this landscape in check? Well, one of the critical things for maintenance here is to keep a check on the uh, exuberant growth. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it happens in phases. You know, we were dry for a while, so it wasn't so much. And, and then we've had a lot of rain, so a lot of things sprout up. But um, with the kind of yards I've experienced probably sometimes you know quarterly or uh, semi-annually that we have to come in and do a little work over where we'll take out some of the aggressive seedlings and a little bit of weeding but very seldom we kind of just let nature take its own course and some things will shade out and perform well or not and so um, maintenance that's kind of the nice thing you don't have to have a steady beat of maintenance you're not coming in every week to do something I won't say it self maintains because there's never been a landscape that'll do that right. unless you want just wild and um, so it's it's a I'd say a spring summer and a late winter we'll come in and do a little tidy up and let it just do its own thing Sandy, we find ourselves in the front yard now, and, and it, it looks like a lot of the same kind of, of changes. In other words, a lot of the lawns removed, okay. which is going to make the area uh, less maintenance intensive for the homeowner. What did you find on this site, and what were their objectives? Uh, primarily, it was to screen, to give some privacy for the homeowner. Mm -hmm. A new development was going in, and, and she wanted to buffer the noise of the traffic and some of the, the pollution that goes along with all that increased traffic. So we took about half the lawn away, again brought out the sod cutter, removed a section of lawn in the middle here, and then brought in about 20 yards of a soil mix that I like to use and went to planting and uh, just made it happen. What are some of the plants that you used in this landscape and, um, and how have they worked together? Um, I started with uh, the thrust was natives, but the homeowner really liked azaleas, and we had one leftover island. Uh, the pine tree had come down in the storm, but the azaleas had, had stayed. So we, I, I put the old traditional Formosa in, which I really love, and some um, Forsythia. I <laughs> took a minute. So creating kind of a base there, wanted to build some right. layers. And then we went to the backyard and searched around for some volunteer trees when we found three oaks and a dogwood and a magnolia that said they'd like to come to the front yard. Excellent. So tiny little trees that they were, they have in 10 years become the main canopy trees for this island. So we have a lot of good activity going on in here. You know, you make a, you make a good point about relocating plants in the landscape. Sometimes we don't necessarily have to go to a garden center for everything that we need. Mm -hmm. and especially when you have a more natural landscape. You know, one thing to remember is that birds are great at spreading yes, seeds around. Are. And if you've got a lot of birds, then you're gonna have you know, things like the beauty berry that are just mm -hmm. popping up in random places. Um, and you know, it's, 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 I think it's very fun to see how they grow and where they grow and, and maybe find new spots, move those plants around. It reduces a lot of the cost, and I think oh, it's yes. a great way to garden. Oh yeah, it has surprised a lot of people when we tell them how young these trees are and where they came from. Andy, as an, as an ecologist that you are, I want, I want to discuss habitat with you. What are the, the criteria of a quality wildlife habitat? Well, the, the four measures that are most commonly used, food, water, shelter, and essentially space to live. And in a situation like this, in a, in a home landscape, uh, one of the, the key elements in all of that is structure, habitat mm -hmm. structure, complex forest structure. So we have a tree canopy, we've got understory, ground cover, and mulch. So uh, all of those elements combined provide uh, all of the four things that we're looking for, the food, water, and shelter. The water for insects are on leaves, but um, the, the mulch itself can't be under, uh, under uh, emphasized. The importance of leaf litter just for earthworm production, isopods, amphipods, all these little things with legs that are food for the blue jays and cardinals, especially during springtime. Also snails. Snails are unsung heroes in our gardens because the shells of snails are an essential calcium source sure. for nesting birds who have, yeah. the females have to replace their calcium. 
What are some of the animals that you've seen move into this property in the wake of building the structure that you're discussing? The two most rewarding groups of animals that we've had here are, of course, birds. We've got uh, azaleas and forsythia, admittedly non-native plants, mm -hmm. but a wildlife habitat doesn't have to be um, strictly native. Uh, but both of these shrubs provide nesting habitat for blue jay, brown thrasher, and northern cardinal. In fact, we've got a cardinal building a new nest in a shrub back over on the side yard. Um, so uh, the birds have come into this yard right away. They feed in other people's yards. Sure, they're bird feeders, but they nest in here. So their life cycle is completed in this yard. The other group of animals are the box turtles, which are an obscure little reptile found. Uh, there are different species around uh, North America. Here we have the eastern box turtle, which is an animal in decline throughout its range. And this yard is supporting no less than four. And what I do, what I get to play with is, is quantifying what animals are using Sandy's gardens. And so I know the four box turtles. I know them individually. There's a male and a female up front and a male and a female in the back. And there's a juvenile who I haven't seen this spring. But um, I know these turtles because they have unique shell patterns. And wow. this is their territory. They don't wander far afield. This is where they live. That's got to be so gratifying. Extremely. <laughs>Sandy, we're now visiting a very different install that you did some years ago as well, and uh, it's it's lovely. But it's Thank you. like you know, like I said, it's quite different than the last landscape that we were looking at. What makes this project different, and what was the scope of the project? Uh, well, this project in itself was a restoration because it was badly damaged after Hurricane Fran. So although where trees were remaining, but had lost so much, and the homeowner wanted to get that woodland habitat going again. So that was our main goal. To re is to regenerate the woodland that had been lost. So what kind of design plan did you put in place? How did you approach it? Well, the approach <laughs> was kind of haphazard. This actually doesn't have a design. We were working with such a, a, a time frame because the storm had been so devastating. So we started with small trees and just did perimeter plantings for those. But with the homeowners busy and wanting to see some real effects, we started to move to the big trees. So it was really a matter, they were so engaged in the mm -hmm. process, we, we would go out together and go hunting plants. So they had their hands in on the process of selection mm -hmm. and or they'd see something and, and I'd fulfill that. So we just kind of worked with what was here and it all evolved really nicely as approach. Something I think that's really neat about a natural landscape is that each one of them are, they're completely different because you're working with the material that's available on that site and you also have infused into that the personality of the homeowner and that designer. You're working with nature and with what you can do as yes. opposed to trying to impose a static design on just a square plot of dirt. Right. Um, tell me about the, the process of, of the plant selection for this site and how it went from what it was, which was once again a pretty open lot, mm -hmm. to this beautiful woodland area. Uh, well, the key to this yard was the dogwood that we're standing under. That mm -hmm. was what drew them into frying the property. And as a result, with all the lawn that was here, it was eliminate some of the lawn, make bigger beds, and since the dogwood was an aging dogwood, they wanted to make sure they had replacements. So we started with dogwoods, a dogwood bed that grew to many other selections, the mock orange, as you see, and then all the beds kind of grew as a result. As this one took its place, it encouraged them to branch out a little bit more. And so we expanded more, less lawn, more trees, and kept adding trees. And along the way, we had an opportunity. Uh, they were getting married, and they needed wedding gifts, and they didn't need anything. And someone in the neighborhood said, well, let's give you trees. And it started <laughs> a flood of trees that were gifts uh, that are here in the yard, many in the yard, the American Beach. Uh, a bur oak at the front, uh, a bed of blueberries on the side, under shade wow. that produce. Wow. Uh, just, I, I can't even remember the birches. There were so many, this is a flood of, of loving gifts in the form of trees for their wedding. And the other really neat thing that happened in the course of designing and choosing plants, um, the homeowner grew up in New York and she discovered uh, the book and the design, the, the design list of plants that was used in her home, her growing up home in New York. And sure enough, she said, well, can we use some of these plants? And we went through the list and we had already planted two or three wow. of the selections that were on there. 
So that meant a lot more to her. It brought her back to her home space in this new home. That's wonderful. Yeah, that was really nice. On this side, there's a quite a bit of slope. And of course, when you're developing a new site and, and say moving all the lawn out, I'm sure that erosion can be an issue. How did you address that? Uh, well, we did it with some of the hard surface, the hardscape. So putting in some of these walkways and a little little walls. Uh, in the back, we've got a dry stream bed and uh, we put in some lawn. We normally take out lawn, but it was so erosive back there, we had to go with a lawn. So we put a, a very successful St. Augustine lawn, been in there for almost 17 years, and it's provided, kept that erosion at bay and helping because they're close to the marsh and we wanted right. to protect that water. So that was a good way to slow the flow. Absolutely. So Andy, we've designed our native habitat and over the years it starts growing in and starts becoming a, a nice, dense, diverse environment. What kind of advice would you give us from a standpoint of just maintaining it practically on a day-to-day -day basis? When you build the backyard habitat for wildlife, wildlife is going to help bring things in. Sure. Uh, squirrels and blue jays will bring in acorns. Suddenly you're going to have oaks and uh, a weed is a plant where you don't want it, and that can include an oak. So you may be finding yourself pulling oaks out of the ground. Um, so there is some maintenance required. It doesn't have to be heavy-handed maintenance, and uh, it may be that there's a branch hanging low in an area where people pass through, and you're going to have a party. Instead of cutting the branch off, you can use a prop to lift it up out of the way as a temporary fix or even leave it. Um, simple pruning, um, there are, for example, right here, we have a bunch of caterpillars feeding on this hornbeam. So this is a host plant for the butterflies' larvae, the butterflies that we love because they're so pretty. Well, here's the host for the larvae. So when you see something like that, don't go out and get the pesticide and come in and spray those. Those are your butterflies. Right. And they're not hurting the tree in any way. Um, azaleas, many of us know that you prune azaleas after they've bloomed. Well, in the spring, that's when birds are nesting in azaleas, right. brown thrashers, northern cardinals, and others. So um, do a, before you do your heavy pruning, go in and, and um, evaluate your property, see who's in there, uh, check the bush to see if somebody is nesting before you go in and start doing any pruning. And the pruning I prefer is with, with hand shears rather than coming in with gas-powered saws and things like that. Very disturbing to wildlife, that noise. And, and so um, maintenance can be done with a delicate hand. But it is, it, I, I don't want anybody to think that a backyard wildlife habitat is something you install and then walk away. No, you can get engaged with your yard and really have fun with it. Sandy, Andy, thank you so much for being with us today. I really feel like we learned a ton about how practical and in some ways how easy it is to create a, a natural landscape. Thank you so much. Well, we appreciate you giving us an opportunity to share what's really a wonderful thing to do by taking that first step and getting out into your yard, engaged and bringing in some wildlife and having a, a lifetime of enjoyment just from doing those few things. I'm inspired. Good, get going. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Another show, another amazing garden. We hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we've enjoyed producing it. If you watch the show, you know we travel the country visiting beautiful gardens. Well, we have a surprise in store for several in the audience. To learn more about the surprise, visit our website at gardensmart.com. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program makes house calls. By ordering online, the lawn you want can be delivered right to your door. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program is a proud sponsor of Public Television and Garden Smart.
I should be arrested for crimes against potted plant kind. My house is where plants came to die. miracle Grow Potting Mix is designed to help grow big, beautiful plants. Everyone grows with miracle Grow. Designing and building a garden that's in harmony with its surroundings does a wonderful job of attracting wildlife right to your back door and is much easier than you might think. If you have questions about anything you've seen today, visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. And remember, even if you're a master gardener, there's always more to learn. So join us next week for more great gardening tips and ideas as we Garden Smart. land of the longleaf pine, the summer land where the sun doth shine, where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great. Here's to down home, the old north state. <laughs>